Amen. There's a Bible in front of you. Most of the scripture is going to be on the screen if you don't, if you didn't bring yours. But the Word of God is important. It's really the only thing that's lasting in what we do together. Um, so I encourage you to follow along or write some notes. We are dealing with the last seven sayings, phrases, things that Jesus spoke from the cross. Not uh, his last things he said while it was necessary the last few days, but just the things he spoke from the cross. And uh, last week we dealt with um, forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Today's word is salvation. Salvation. And uh, we're going to grab that from the Luke 23, third, starting at verse 39. Luke 23, starting at verse 39. So, are you ready? Yes. You guys warm? Is it? <laughs> okay. Hear then these words. Then, one of the criminals who was, who were hanged, blasphemed him, being Jesus, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you were under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Let's pray together, Father. This is your word. We are your children. This is your world. Speak to us, we pray. We give you permission to speak life into our life. To speak truth into this day. To call on us. Call us to you. Have your way among us, we pray. Hide me and reveal thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Except for the fact that he was actually dying and suffering and bleeding, that's a really good moment. Today you will be with me in paradise. Well, it's hard to imagine, right? It's hard to imagine being that, in that place um, where you know that your time is up. There's nothing you can do. No one's going to rescue you. No one's going to save you. But to hear these words. And, and we gather out of this, and we say it all the time, we've used this passage, this little story, so many times in so many ways. To say that we believe that this this thief, the criminal on this side, is going to heaven. He's going to be, when you and I pass through the gates, when we see Christ, whatever that looks like, when we get there, and whatever our understanding is, we believe, we claim that this teaches us that this thief is going to be there with us. Amen? Amen? I mean, that is, and that is why, that is the, what we're talking about today, salvation. Salvation is a word. We believe, and we talk about it all the time, and you've heard it, you probably said it. Are you saved? Are you saved? Is your brother saved? Is your wife saved? Are you saved? Right? Amen. You, are you? Amen. And this, this word salvation has so much wrapped in it. In fact, this, I only have 20 minutes, right? I got 22 minutes. That's better. Hey, 22 minutes. This might be the most important 22 minutes of your entire life. Amen. Because this is the most important word that the Bible talks about from beginning to end. is salvation. Salvation from what? We've spent a lot of time talking about that, so I'm not going to go into it. But it's salvation. Meaning, what are you saved from? What if Spider-Man swings down and saves you? What is he saving you from? Not the bad guys. Saving you from... The wrath of God, which shall be poured out on all iniquity. 
God is just, and sin must be punished. And in the end, in the last days, at some point, God will get his due. He will punish those for their sins. Amen. So when we are saved, we are saved from God, actually. We are saved from the wrath of God, which is justly poured out on the sins of the wicked. We are saved from that. So salvation is a big deal because it means our eternal life is going to be spent not in punishment for what we deserve, but in eternity in glory with God. That's a big deal, amen? amen. Come on, that is a big deal. You guys are not even, you're not excited. This is, <laughs> this is, it ought to be what we're talking about all the time. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to take off my shoes and walk on the streets of gold. Amen. Gold, it's going to be a little cold. If you ever walked on gold, you know, it's cold and beautiful. There's not going to be a shadow in the place. There's not going to be a moment, a second of despair in my head. Not one single thought of sorrow or despair or anger or sin or regret. Amen. I mean, not one single thought. It is going to be pure joy, love. I mean, you think I like you now. Wait till we get there. <laughs> you think you like me now. Wait till we get there. You're going to love me. You're not going to find one thing wrong with me. Not one thing. <laughs> and that's, that's salvation. That's what we're promised. That's what we're going for. And this, this boy on the cross, he says, I deserve what I'm getting. He doesn't. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I want to, I want to jump to Romans 10, but I want to wrap up this idea of salvation and really get a hand. Because this is just way too easy, isn't it? Amen. I mean, that is just, that's almost too easy to believe. You, you're a convicted scoundrel, self-admitted thief. You deserve to die on the cross. You're getting what you deserve. You're, you're, and all you have to do is look over to Jesus and say, remember me. And that's it? You get to go to heaven for that? It just, and it is. And I, I want to, I think I can defend that it is just that easy. And I think I can say where in the Bible that God has always had that same plan. And you and I, the church people, um, we're, we're the same as the Jews when they, they were accused of, of taking this message of the gospel. We're the chosen people. And then you get one proselyte. You baptize one person into to becoming a Jew with you. And then you heap on him rules and regulations so that he is more oppressed and, and more changed than he was before he was saved. You, you know, we can do that as church people. We run into somebody and they are in their last Hope. They, they have nothing left. They're in despair. They're, they're going to lose their house. They're going to lose their family. They're going to they're gonna lose their loved one. They're going to lose their whatever it is. And they cry out to you. And you're there as a good believer in Christ. And what do you say? Well, I didn't bring my little bookmark that has the Roman roads, Roman road of salvation to walk you through all this. And I don't have my Bible with me. Or maybe you should go to church with me on Sunday. We have all these other requirements that, that we fumble with. And then once they do bring them to church, we, we give them the list of rules that this is the way we do church around here. And I just think that it might be a little simpler than that. I think God's requirements of just looking to Christ and calling Him Lord and crying out to Him is enough. I think the thief got it right. And I think our theology and the whole Bible teaches that, so that's what we're going to kind of wrap up in the next few minutes together. And I'm going to jump to Romans to do that. Romans chapter 10. I'm going to go the whole, through the whole thing. You know when I got notes, you guys are in trouble because I can never figure out what I'm supposed to say when I actually write it down. But I think we are here. In Romans 10, um, we're going to... 
jump to let's jump to verse eight. Because he starts out in, in Romans talking about the difference between the law and grace. And you're under the law, but if we're under the law of Moses, then if Moses if we insist on obeying the law of Moses in order to be saved, then we're going to have to live by that. And not only that, we're going to have to live up to it. And nobody's been able to do that. So we're not under the law anymore. And then he says in verse 8, but what does it say? In other words, the scriptures. What, what, let's, let's quote the scriptures. He says, but what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be what? Saved. saved. So if you confess with your mouth, if you say it out loud, if you agree with it, that's what confess means, if you agree with what your heart believes. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Maybe that's what the thief did. What did he do? He confessed with his mouth. What did he say? Lord. Lord. He called Jesus Lord. And he said he was undeserved of punishment. So he was innocent and he was Lord. And that's a big deal because it's not like this is the first time he's ever saved. So let's, let's not create this whole situation into this two or three minutes. Because Jesus had been in the area for several years. But in the last year, several months, everybody in the area knew, knew of him, heard of him, knew what he was teaching and preaching and his miracles. Herod did. Pilate did. Remember, Herod was anxious to, to see him because he'd heard so much about him. And then he's got a sign above him that says, King of the Jews. And then he's got people walking around the cross saying, You're the Christ, save yourself. So with all this mocking and declaration and all the things he went through and all the stories he heard about Jesus, it could be, very well could be, that this thief had seen him or heard him in the area before he got caught for his crime. He probably heard all the rumors of the trial and all the things that went through. And all that he heard and saw was the same thing that everybody else heard and saw. Same thing that the mockers heard and saw. But he called him Lord. <clears throat> he also said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So what is he saying there? Well, for one, he must believe that there's life after death, because that's what's happening next. There's no evidence to him or anything that Jesus is going to get down and walk away, go back into Jerusalem and take over and establish his kingdom. And there's certainly no evidence that he's going to get down and live. I mean, time is up. So anything that he is hoping for, or asking for, or expecting is in the next life, not this one. Amen. And he believes that this Lord, this innocent Lord beside him, is also a king. And that he will get his kingdom in the next life. And when he does, he wants to be there. That's a believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, it sounds like to me. So, Paul goes on to say in Romans 10, For with the heart one believes, under righteousness. So what you believe establishes your position with God. Your belief. We can also put the word faith in. Under righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And we, we gotta be not we gotta be careful not to go into a, a dangerous territory where we say that um, it's not just by faith alone, by grace alone, through faith you are saved, by faith alone through it's it, we have to add to that a couple of things. We don't want to say that. Because it is. It is Christ who saves. It is the power of God who saves. You can't do anything to add to that. Salvation is all of God. But the belief in your heart is a gift from God. It is the Holy Spirit that's acting on your behalf to convince you and convict you that what you see, what you're saying is truth. Amen. And when you agree with that, confess it, 
you were declared righteous. And when you say it out loud, you have claimed your salvation. Confess with your mouth. Confession made. Confession is made on the salvation of verse 10. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is generous or mercy or rich to all who call upon him. And this is the word for the day. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the answer. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's quoting back, that's back to Joel, that's back in the Old Testament times, that's, that's going way back, and that has always been God's plan. For whoever calls on me will not be put to shame. Whoever calls on me will not see iniquity. Whoever calls on me, I will answer. It's a calling on the name of the Lord that saves us. Verse 14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? In other words, to call on Christ is a statement of belief in your heart. And you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. When you call on the Lord, you believe something eternal about the Lord. That he is Lord and that he can save you. And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Just that it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. I am here to preach to you glad tidings. Amen. I have been sent to preach to you glad tidings. The good news. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. In order for the salvation to come, you have to hear the good news, which you just did, and you have to believe on the good news, and then you have to call on Him. That's the way it goes. The preacher must be sent. The preacher must preach the good news. You can't just have a preacher who preaches anything. I've been accused of preaching about my grandkids way too much. I'm here to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. The preached good news must be heard. That's why I'm screaming at you right now. <coughs> the heard good news must be believed. You don't have to understand everything, but you have to believe it by faith. And the belief must be the kind that calls on God for salvation. That was the backwards way of saying, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The belief must be in the kind that calls God on, on calls on God for salvation. Sending, preaching, hearing, believing, and then calling on God. So we're going to boil this whole salvation, all this theology, down to call on God. When you're lost, call on God. Because you are declaring God can find me. And He can help me be found. He can help me get to where I need to go. When I'm hurting I'm calling on God because He can take away my pain or soothe me through it if I'm facing a mountain I can't climb or whatever the, the bad news is. Whatever situation in your life is, the answer is the same. Always call on the name of the Lord. Amen. Call on the name of the Lord. You, I, mostly, only call when things are bad. And when we're desperate. And when we only have a few minutes to live. And there's no way out. Then, hopefully, many of us, we've had the testimony one after another of getting to that point. That's my testimony. I heard his name a million times. I'd even been to church a few times. But it wasn't until I was, figuratively speaking, in my last moments. Till I cried out to him. And he answered immediately. Today, he said, you will be with me. Today, you will be with me. 
and, I, and a new life began for me. Third Day has a song called Born Again. If you ever tune into the iTunes, it's called Born Again. It feels like I'm born again. It feels like I'm living for the very first time. It feels like I'm breathing for the very first time. Feels like I'm moving for the very first time. It's all new. Switchfoot has a song a few years back. It says, Dare You to Move. And look that one up, it's pretty cool. It says, Welcome to the planet, welcome to redemption. Here you go. Everybody's here. We've been waiting on you. Now get up. I dare you to get up off the floor and live like today has never happened before. Because salvation for the thief was immediate and eternal, and he's in glory. But salvation for you and I is something we live out every day. And I believe what God has called us to do is to live out our life of salvation the same way we started this life, by calling on his name. We wake up in the morning. Lord Jesus, I'm yours. I'm here. Meet me. Take me. Use me. Fill me. Let's do this together. It's the first day of an... I've never had this day before. You've been here already. I am yours. I don't know what to say in this first meeting I'm going to. I don't know what to say when I call her. I don't know how to answer her because I know they're hurting. I don't know what to do with my money. I'm running out of this. I'm running out of time. Call upon the name of that is the answer. That is so easy. Isn't it? Yeah. God in all his wisdom knows that we are not that smart. And he didn't set up this life with him to be one that only the scholars can understand. Or only the learner. In fact, sometimes we can be way too smart for our own good. We can read too much theology for our own good. So let me see. Let me back it up. I have a couple minutes left. <clears throat> a couple stories that might, that in Scripture, that help back up what I'm telling you right now. One of them comes from Acts, right after the day of Pentecost, and Peter is preaching a sermon. It's Acts chapter 2. And he's standing up at the 11, he raised his voice, and he said, Men of Judah, this is, we're not drunk. These guys aren't drunk. This is what was prophesied before you from the prophet Joel. Shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit in all flesh. For your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders and signs from heaven. And then he closes out in, chapter, in verse 21. And it shall come to pass in those days that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever calls on... And you are in the whoever. If you have not called, if you are still on this side wondering, then today is the day to call on his name. Whoever calls on his name shall be saved. That's what Joel said. That's what the prophet said way back. But there's another story. This is from Mark chapter 10. Now they came to Jericho. You know the story, so I'm not going to teach it, but I'm going to show you and remind you what he said. Now they came to pass that they came to Jericho, Jesus and his disciples, and there was a great multitude with them. And as they were passing, blind Bartimaeus, who was the son of Timaeus, sat at the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth coming by, he began to cry out and said, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. He called out. He called on the name of the Lord. And it fits the pattern, doesn't it? Because he's sitting there. He's desperate. He's heard about this Jesus. And he finds out that Jesus is near, and in his desperation, 
He calls upon the name of the Lord. He says, Jesus, Son of David. Son of David is his declaration, is his proclamation of faith that Jesus is the Messiah, because that's what Son of David means. So he calls on the name of the Lord. In his heart, he believes that he is Jesus, he's the Christ. And with his mouth, he confesses, Lord, have mercy on me. Forgive me, heal me. So he believes that he's the Messiah, and he also believes that he can heal him. And he, he believes it, and he confesses it. And anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, which he did, shall be saved. And by order of God himself, Jesus hears his name being called by one in trouble, and he answers. And at the end of that, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, I want to see. So his face says, this Messiah can heal my sight. He can do anything. And Jesus says, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. It doesn't say your faith has given you sight. And it doesn't say by crying you, you did it. But by calling on me, by believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth who you believe I am, by calling on my name, you are made whole. You're saved. Because why? Because whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. And how are they going to call unless they believe? And how are they going to believe unless they hear the gospel? And how are they going to hear the gospel unless someone teaches them the gospel? And how is someone going to teach them or preach them the gospel unless I send them? And we're back to where we start. There's more. A couple more. In case you think this is just New Testament theology, but God didn't really mean that. From the beginning, he meant that. And there's a few from Psalms. In Psalm 18, I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. David believed. All he had to do was call on the name of the Lord, and he's saved from his enemies. In Psalm 50, call upon me, the Lord says, in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you. Call on me in your days of trouble, and I will deliver you. When he calls to me, I will answer him, and I will be with him in his time of trouble, and I will rescue him, and I will honor him, says the Lord. In Psalm 145, the Lord says, The Lord is near to all who call on him. To all who call on him in truth. I think the truth is from the very beginning, the plan of God confused with all the rules and regulations and all the law and all the liturgies and all of the, the rites and rituals that we dump on this whole relationship, the truth that just boils down into this, if you need, then call on his name. And I am now sending you to preach the good news. Because we have room for another 200 people in here and there are 2,000 within five miles that don't even know him. And who knows how many of those are suffering, who are lost, confused, who don't know how to get through what they're going through, who don't know the answer to their problem. And it's a very simple answer. Don't, you don't have to confuse them with church or denominations. You don't even need to have all your Bible verses memorized ahead of time. All you need to do is say, let me tell you the good news. Jesus Christ is Lord, and you can call on him because he's near to all who call on him and will answer. He will deliver you from your troubles. He will save you from your enemies. He is ever near and ready to hear. It's a very simple message that you and I have been sent to declare. One day we will give an answer for the opportunities that God gave us to declare his mighty works among the nations, to speak the good news to those in trouble. It may be that you are the only one in someone's life who knows that truth. So I encourage you to do two things. I'm going to leave you with two things. One, if you have not made that declaration, if, if you've never been to that point, if life has never been bad enough for you to make that call, don't wait. Call on his name today and you shall be saved. Amen. I'm going to pray for you. We have folks that will pray with you. It's nothing magic. It's not even walking up here that makes that real. But you do need to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
and you need to say it. You need to call on him. So if today, if you've never done that, today's your day. As the, as the old guys used to say, the church doors are open. That's not how you join Riverton. That's how you get to go to paradise with him. Jesus will meet you right now, and a new life begins. And if that day has been so long ago that the, the glory of it has worn off, that the reality and the, and the preciousness of who you are in him is fading, then today as we sing and we, we close, call on his name. Call on his name and ask him to refresh you, to rebuild your faith, to rekindle the fires of love in your heart for him, to return that first love. And if you come today with a, with a burden that is too heavy to bear, then come Come forward and call on his name and we'll, God will come and hear your call and rescue you. That's his promise. I believe it's true. Let's pray. Let's stand as we do this and pray. Make it easy for folks to come. We have folks that will pray for you. And I challenge you, secondly, to praise him in the good times. People need to hear his name on our lips when things are sunny and happy going well. Amen. Amen. Father, hear the cries of your children as we sing and come to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.